Did you ever get back from a conference and you were so inspired, you saw so much great content, you talked to so many great people, you have pages and pages of notes and ideas and ways you can take your author business and you're not sure where to start? Well, one of the ways is actually going over your notes with another person so that you can bounce those ideas off them. Were you ever upset that there was a conference taking place and you were not able to get there? And wouldn't it be great to have access to somebody who went to that conference and took a lot of notes and is willing to share? Well, both of those things are what this episode is about. I was at Novelist Inc. last week in Florida, and I'm going to be sharing my reflections on that experience for you. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 270 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I'm going to be sharing some post-Nink reflections, and that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you to the ability to get your audiobook out into the global market at more than 43 retailers and libraries. And as of just recently, the audiobooks, uh, if you've opted in through Findaway Voices, audiobooks are available now on Spotify a la carte. I was so thrilled as a Canadian who normally can't see what's going on in the U.S. store because it is U.S. only right now, currently. But I was so excited when I was in the U.S. last week and I could go to Spotify and I could see all of my audiobooks available on Spotify and I'm so excited. I'm excited to be in early because Spotify is, of course, a gigantic global network, very, very popular for streaming music. They have millions and millions of customers. I, I wrote down the number somewhere, but I don't have it right in front of me, but they've got a gigantic global base. But I'm excited for when they start to ramp up audiobooks and really push audiobooks because they have the ability for recommendations, etc. And so I'm thrilled to have my audiobooks with Spotify, as well as the other 43 plus retail and library platforms that you can get into through Findaway Voices. Now, this episode, I'm going to be talking about Novelist Sync. I had a wonderful opportunity to reconnect with several of the amazing folks from Findaway. Spotify, find a way. Uh, again, they are part of the larger organization of Spotify, but I always say this is very much like when Rakuten acquired Kobo. It was a major international player, and uh, Kobo still operated um, the way they did from the, their home base in Toronto. And the Find a Way Voices team are all the people we've known and loved over the years who are still operating a phenomenal author first, author friendly team that I adore. And I got to see a really great presentation from Will from Findaway Voices. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later in the episode. But one of the things that uh, we were reminded of for for, um, the connection with Spotify and audiobooks are different ways that you can just market your audiobooks, leveraging the different audio platforms. And I will talk a little bit about that in my Reflections of Novelist Sync coming up later. But if you want to see how you as an author can leverage Findaway Voices, how you can leverage their tools to upload your own audio, their tools to find via Marketplace, find a narrator to work with, or to take advantage of their in-house staff who will do a more hands-on project managed role in helping you find between five and ten of the best narrators from their network of thousands of professional narrators around the world. There's so many different ways you can leverage Findaway Voices. And if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Dear, dear listener, this is going to be a relatively short episode. This is going to be 
an episode where I just turn on the mic and no script, go off the top of my head, which is kind of what I do for the reflection part anyway. But the entire episode is going to be my reflections of getting back from Nink, novelist Inc. And I'll explain what that is later if you're not familiar with it. I am short of time. I basically had a relatively shorter week because of travel earlier this week, and that kind of threw me off. And I've got deadline after deadline after deadline, and I have not had time to spend the several hours that I do on the podcast and I'm getting towards the end of the day and I still have two more meetings um, this evening and and so I'm trying to squeeze this episode in and make sure that I still continue to deliver an episode every single week. I have not failed you in five years and I don't plan on failing you now. So it will be a relatively short unscripted episode but there will be reflections based on the 40 odd pages of notes I uh, took at Novel Sync. So I'm going to be skipping in the comments from recent episodes, etc. And personal updates going to be kind of a eh, whole part of the whole whole episode. So why don't we just, you know, play that bumper music and uh, let me get started. Okay, here goes with my Nink reflections or my Nink 2022 reflections. So Nink is, uh, or I'm, I'm saying NINC, it's really the, the annual NINC conference, is run by Novelists, Inc. And this is an organization of professional writers who have been holding this conference, well, since I've been going, it's always been in Florida, but it used to be in different locations over the years. And it is a phenomenal conference. And and just a little bit of a background is to become a, a, an um, author who is a member of NINC, you have to make a minimum amount of money. Now, when I first started attending Nink and going to Nink, it was mostly traditionally published authors, and there were a few outliers who were self-publishing and making good money, and they could become members. And I was one of the oddballs, the weirdos, the guys from the fringe who was coming in and talking about self-publishing and, and ebook only options, and not, well, ebook only but just the, the money you could make from ebooks alone. And now, it has evolved over the years that uh, there's still a traditional publishing contingent to it, but it's more hybrid. It's authors who are doing both. They're deciding to work with publishers. They're deciding to also self-publish. And it's a lot heavier skewed towards self-publishing. So I'm probably one of the one of the uh, fewer people there who is very familiar with traditional publishing and novelist ink, whereas in the early days, I was one of the only ones who really, really knew self-publishing. Well, of, of course, I should say a lot of the romance uh, writers were in on it early because they saw they could they saw what they could do, and so, anyways, Novelist Inc. is a phenomenal conference. I I believe I've been going probably since 2012, so it would have been uh, 10 years. Now I missed a couple years, so I think I've been going to Novelist Inc. for eight years, and it's held in uh, St. Pete, uh, St. Pete's Beach, or St. Pete Beach, I should say, uh, in St. Petersburg in uh, Florida, which is on the Gulf Coast. Now, that is the area that just got hit uh, yesterday. I'm recording this on um, Friday, September, uh, Thursday, September 29th. And yesterday on the 28th was when uh, Hurricane Ian uh, came in and, and, and just, you know, devastated one of the worst, um, you know, hurricanes that's hit that area or hit anywhere in, in the United States for something like 100 years. And so my, my, my thoughts and my hopes and my wishes, uh, all my positivity are going out to anyone that I know who's, who's down there. And I do have friends down there and I have seen from a few of them uh, to see that they are okay, but I'm, I'm very concerned about their safety and their well-being. But yeah, so it's, uh, that's where it is, is on, on the Gulf, on the Florida. And we stay at the, this beautiful resort. It's been at this resort for almost all but one of the years I, I went to Nink. Is that the trade winds right on the beach? So not only are you in a wonderful place, because you know where I live in Canada, it's chilly now. You're wearing jackets and stuff like that. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's humid, and I did not complain about the heat. I loved it so much. And you're on the beach, and you can be hanging out with authors at the tiki bar at night. And you're really you're working with uh, hanging out and liaising with uh, industry folks and and amazing authors who are really taking things to the next level. I learned so much from Nink every single year. And so it's just this really phenomenal experience. Now, one of the things about this year was this year was was absolutely phenomenal. And I think it's partially 
I, it was good. The content was good. The organizers are amazing people. All of the presenters that uh, I saw were fantastic. Uh, the networking, the authors that were there, just amazing. Well over, I think it was over, well over 400 people that were there. They even had an app this year where you can kind of connect on the app and, and do a little breakout groups and sessions and like people who write certain genres could get together in the evening and plan things out. Yeah, I used it to plan my beer crawl, which I always do on the Tuesday prior to the conference starting. It's one of those unofficial kickoffs to Nink. But it was fantastic. It was amazing. But I think part of part of that in my mind was I hadn't gone in two years. My last novel, I think, was 2019. So getting back there. Now, and they did have a couple. Uh, they had uh, smaller ones and in 2020, 2021 because they had commitments with the hotel and they had to, uh, all, you know, it would have lost a lot of money. So they still did it. And I think there was like 40 people or something like a very, very small group of people, uh, you know, in the height of the pandemic that, that made it there. And I remember um, doing a, a virtual presentation for Draft to Digital in 2020 for Nink. And I think the only people that were there <laughs> were uh, a few of the volunteers and, it, <laughs> and everyone else was watching it online. So it, it's, it's great to see it back. It was great to be back in person. But the the content was 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 phenomenal and, and and again maybe it was my my desire to want to just chat with people and have those hallway or lobby conversations that we did but i've got a notebook here and what i thought i would do is just kind of flip through it because i went to a, a good number of sessions i didn't go to all the sessions but i went to a number of sessions and i took all kinds of notes so first one here and i'm just just going to kind of go through and, and kind of share some of the things i learned so that you dear listener can benefit from it. So uh, Julie from BNN Press. So for anyone who's using Barnes Noble Press directly, so uh, a couple things I, I noted was the Nook app has been updated. It now integrates books audio, which is great, kind of like Kobo. So that's that's been a phenomenal thing. There's an indie storefront on Nook for uh, for Barnes and Noble and Draft to Digital books. So no matter how the indie uh, books get there, there's an indie storefront specifically on Nook, which I think is kind of cool that they're spotlighting indie authors. I'm going to have to find that, find out more from Julie, maybe even have her on the podcast so she can talk a little bit about that. They also now have a, a flat rate, which is um, relatively new. Um, it, it's been there for a little while, but it's a flat 70% rate at 99 cents and up. And there used to be uh, below two ninety nine, you would get less. So that's, that's, a, that's a major improvement, much better than the 35% you get when you go lower than uh, two ninety nine on um, Amazon, for example. They have a six-month uh, window for print book pre-orders because you can do print books directly there. Uh, they also have uh, in their promotions tab a coupon tool, and I've, I've talked about that in the book Wide for the Win, and I think I've talked about that in the podcast before, where you can create an X percent off uh, promo or you can do like a buy one, uh, get one X percent off, like a BOGO sale. And, and, and one of the ideas that they suggested is that, it's okay, so for your books on Barnes & Noble, you get to the end of book one, you use the coupon tool and say, okay, do you want to get book two for 50% off or get book two for whatever, you know, 75% off, whatever it is to try and entice them to pick up book two. Great, great idea. So you could do that on Barnes & Noble. You can do it on Google Play. You can do it on the Smashwords store, but you can self-generate your own coupons. So that's kind of cool. So that's a really exciting thing. Actually, I made a note here. I've got to talk to uh, Jason uh, through draft to digital to see if we can do that for authors on <laughs> draft to digital. So that's another personal note. I'm just reminding myself of. Um, they have a top indie favorites feature. It's bi-monthly. Um, they usually have more than 100, uh, you know, curated titles. They also have something that I didn't realize, and I'll have to go and add this into Wide for the Win. Is they have a My Contributors page, and this is for virtual assistants. So draft to digital has that, and I believe Apple. Um, if you're publishing directly at Apple has that, but now Barnes and Noble has that too. So Kobo Writing Life does not have that. And Amazon uh, KDP does not have that. And that's really, really handy if you want to give people access to update books for you. They also have the ability to upload your own custom book samples, kind of like Apple has. So it doesn't have to be the first 5% of the book or 10% of the book. You can do that. And Julie said ideas, you could include a coupon code in there to pick up the book. Hey, you've read the preview? Hey, get this book for 50% off or whatever it is, right? Uh, so that's just sort of a high level of, of what I saw from um, Barnes & Noble Press. Then uh, Findaway, so Will uh, Degas, who is the head of uh, Findaway uh, Voices. Uh, so he was just talking a little bit about Spotify. So Spotify has ratings, which is great. They have a la carte uh, purchases. 
Um, and then they have uh, price promos that are uh, uh, you can get through Findaway Voices. And I've already done that. I've already set up a price promo through Findaway Voices for one of my audiobooks. Uh, I was so excited. I logged into Findaway Voices. I'm like, oh my god, I can now do price promos for Spotify as well. So that's fantastic. I can do BNN, I can do Apple, I can do Chirp, and I can do Spotify. The other thing that Will said, and I quoted this, is we've built our brand on wide, and that's not changing. And that was in response to people's fears that, oh no, we're going to have exclusivity programs with uh, Spotify and, and all that stuff. And he said, no, we built our brand on wide, and that is not changing. So that was kind of cool. But then Will reminded us when he talked about the seven-year exclusivity clause that you may sign with Audible, etc., just how much has changed in five years. Five years ago, Findaway Voices didn't even exist, or just a little over five years ago, they didn't exist. How much has changed in the past five years? Pandemic aside, how much has changed in the past five years? So think about that when you're thinking about your long-term strategies. I think about how many audiobooks I did not have five years ago. And so this is uh, really exciting. Uh, Will also shared some audio insights, which I think are really cool. And I'm just going to share one of them here with you. Uh, and this is just sort of a look at wide units sold. Uh, so so units sold through Findaway Voices. So these are just books in typical, uh, in general, library uh, sales, uh, audiobook library sales are 26.59%. And retail subscription sales, which would be sort of like to places like Audible and with Kobo where they have subscription sales where somebody, uh, the user pays a monthly fee and gets a coupon code. Those are 36.77%. And then retail a la carte where instead of using, you know, the monthly coupon or the monthly token, uh, they just buy the audiobook outright. That's 36.65%. But then via the promotions that people are running through Findaway, the library, uh, that changes, and the uh, a la carte jumps up to 46%, because it's a la carte where you're getting the, hey, this book is discounted to whatever, uh, and so there's that call to action that says, well, I'm not going to use a $15 or $12.99 um, you know, token, I'm going to get this book for $2.99 or $0.99 cents or whatever. So that's where retail a la carte goes to 46%, uh, uh, retail subscription goes down to 31%, and library 22%. Uh, 0.49%. So that was an interesting thing to see from Findaway Voices. The other thing, and I'd mentioned this earlier, is Will gave us some ideas on different things you could do with audio, especially leveraging platforms like Findaway. So right now, one of the things I personally have is uh, Julie Strauss and I have the read by the author version that's on a podcast. And so the, on Spotify, you can listen to the podcast of Lover's Moon for free. It's just three more weeks to go before the it wraps up. But we also have the audiobook that I've published through Find A Way, which is the read by the author's version. Um, and it's only $4.99. And then when we get the professional version, we're going to get the professional version, which is going to be the full-priced version with the professional narrators. Um, and so there's three different versions. Now, the, the reason there's a third version, uh, there, there will be a second version of the of the audiobook, but the reason there's going to be a third version is uh, Julie and I uh, created a playlist. So we were joking when we were, um, Michael and Gail, the two main characters, were talking about, you know, songs to listen to when you're, when you're being intimate. And uh, th there's a joke there because Michael says, you know, songs to make love to, and, and Gail says, no, songs to f-bomb too uh i'm trying to keep this family friendly but uh so she she's very much of this these are songs that we really want to get you know down and dirty with and he's more the romantic uh so that's just part of their personalities but julie and i were joking about the songs michael would pick and the songs gail would pick and we came up with a playlist while we were working on the book and so uh when i was at novelist inc last week i you know after after the session i texted julie and i said send me the pr playlist and I created a playlist on Spotify, which is the official Lover's Moon playlist, which is basically, you know, 38 songs. Um, some of them related. Uh, some One of them is actually referred to um, in, in the song, which is uh, Werewolves of London. Uh, it actually it happens in a scene. And, and then, of course, you've got other uh, related songs, but also songs that they even specifically talk about. So it, it, we just thought it'd be fun to create that. So there's this additional thing associated with our book but but we'll talk even about doing what about uh, your own cliff notes or, or cole's notes for us canadians uh cliff notes uh your own book which is notes uh, about your book that you can maybe put between uh, chapters and stuff like that or even summaries because he indicated that you know the average audiobook is eight to ten hours 
And nobody sits and listens to an audiobook, uh, usually in one in one setting, typically. So they come back to it, and they usually stop at the end of a chapter. So we talked about doing things like the, you know, like in an episodic television show. So Liz and I are watching uh, The West Wing, and it says, you know, previously on The West Wing, and there's and there's the little clips, so you can kind of catch you up to get you warmed up for the new the new episode. What about that? You know, previously. And, you know, in chapter one or whatever, and just a quick 30 second summary. Now, I do remember Terry Follis doing this when he was doing the original The Best Laid Plans podcast. Uh, He would just remind people of what had happened up to that point. So if it had been a while, you know, between listening to chapter one and chapter two, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that now. That cool. Thanks for the summary. Uh, And again, and, and you have it as a separate file so people can just skip it if they want to skip it but make it nice and short. That was just one of them. And then Will reminded me of something uh, that uh, was from, uh, oh my God, what the heck's the name of the book? And I forgot the name of the book, but it's by Chip and Dan Heath. And I think it's called The Power of Moments. Yeah, I think that's the name of the title. I remember reading it several years ago and he talked about the Popsicle Hotline at a hotel in Las Vegas, Los Angeles. One of the losses somewhere in California. Not California. Vegas is in Nevada. Some are somewhere down warm. You know, see, I'm, I'm up in Canada. They're all the same place to me. They're down somewhere warm. But um, the Popsicle hotline that this hotel had, and it was this, the things that you can do for readers that they remember, like the Popsicle hotline. And maybe I'll explain that in a future episode if you want to hear what that story is. But he, he suggested to think about celebrations for readers who finish the book. What can you put in there? It's like, I finished the book. I want something else. What can you do for them? Be creative. You are writers. So that's a really exciting thing. So that was just some of that. Now, the next session I went to was with Elena Johnson. And and this was uh, her take on Wide. And I was really, really curious about this. But sort of the takeaway. And again, I'm just going to uh, probably come back to this and would love to interview her uh, for an episode of the podcast. But she said the key, key, key thing for wide publishing is persistent, consistent effort. Whether you're wide, whether you're exclusive to Amazon. And her version of wide is that you don't have to, you know, when you're publishing wide, it's not an exclusively wide thing. You can do both. And so that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, you can actually have both. And so she she also recommends, and I love this so much, is do not operate your business from a place of fear. You're making decisions based on long-term strategies, not on your fear. So that's a really exciting thing to see. She also said, if there's benefits to be used or leveraged at a retailer, use them, take advantage of them, whether that's the promotions tab and the way that you're publishing or other, other things that come up. So... I've often recommended with people who are coming out of Kindle Unlimited, I often recommended the libraries, uh, you know, because everyone can get it for free there, but unlimited reading. But she also says, maybe you should, you know, tell people about Kobo Plus because there's another retailer that has a great reader, et cetera, great reader experience. And uh, Kobo Plus gives you everything that they're looking for, which is all you can read, but no exclusivity clause as well. So I think she said something like, I want to have my, Kindle Unlimited, Kindle Unlimited and Be Wide too, because you can be both, and that that is one methodology of wide. Dave Chesson did an amazing session on uh, NFTs and blockchain, and I was very curious to see what. Because Dave Chesson's the mastermind behind um, uh, Atticus, uh, ebook formatting tool, and of course publisher Rocket used to be KDP Rocket, and. Dave's agreed to come on the podcast, so I'm going to have him come on the podcast and talk a little bit about NFTs and blockchains, and I just love the way he broke it down and he explained it in English for us, and then talked about what he, what his thoughts were on that, which was amazing. I have many, many pages of notes that I'm just skipping through for here. Vanessa Vale did a great session on Go Wider, uh, earning seven figures from your backlist, and it was um, she runs Thrifty Tips for Authors. I'll put a I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That was a really great uh, site, um, uh, Facebook group, and uh, and and she she did this great thing with spreadsheets where you can visualize your IP. You could visualize your backlist and 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 thinking about how you can visually kind of estimate what your um, what your potential worth is 
for the title bases. And uh, again, that would probably be a, a full episode talking to her about that. So I am going to talk to her and see if she can come on another episode. But what I really, really loved is the simplification of a spreadsheet that can kind of show all the different assets that a single book could have. Because each asset, uh, each that book on every single retailer, that book in different formats, and then suddenly seeing how that can expand and how that can get you to a much larger income, or at least understand better your uh, your income potential, which is great. Nick Thacker uh, did a talk uh, about uh, marketing. I went to one of his marketing talks, and uh, there were some great notes I, I took from that. But I think one of the one of the things that I really really liked uh, was one of the, uh, the quotes he said is a good book written for a well defined audience. A good book written for a well defined audience will outperform an amazing book written for the wrong audience. And that was fan. Fantastic. I kind of love that sort of thought. And he also said it's easier to craft a book instead of an audience. So again, he's reminding you for marketing, you got to go back and really understand who your audience is and you're giving the audience what they want. And that was so, so critical. He had um, um, a tip about uh, specific uh, AMS ad advice uh, that he talked about and he walked through. I'll probably do that. I'll probably run that. I made notes on how to do that and then I'll report back to let you guys know how that worked. But um, I'm really curious uh, to check that out. But that was just really an amazing thing. And, and engagement, again, he reminded like Will did, engagement with your audience is really important, really uh, cool. And he, of course, reminded the authors that your website is your home base. And he talked about social media as outposts and even talked about, so the tool of like email marketing is to bring them back to your home base potentially where you're in control, not a retailer. Now, and then the final thing was a summary from Lou uh, Ronica, who does have a, a, a significant decades of traditional publishing experience, but also gets and understands and operates within indie publishing. And he runs a small publishing house that operates very dynamically like an independent publisher but also takes advantage of warehousing and all the things that trad pubs do so his overall message was yeah okay thanks been a tough year things sales have been down etc but everything's great everything's fine and and he said that there is an enormous customer base that wants what we what we, we create they want books and we have to remember that he says that this will probably be the first meaningful recession since the streaming era, and to remember that historically, books have always been recession-proof. But reminding us that people who love books really, really love books, and they define themselves as book lovers. So one of the interesting things that we're going to see is this is the first time that you know books have always been recession-proof, but now that we have streaming, streaming is a competition for books. So we're, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there, but he's very, very optimistic because people who really, really love books and define themselves as book lovers are probably going to figure out ways to continue to get access to books. Now that may change. It may be subscription programs. It may be more library sales, but that's okay. There are ways for authors to earn money. He also said um, there's a lot more room for crossover between the things trad publishers are doing and indie publishers are doing. And I'm really, really agree with him. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of that. But he also uh, speculated that there will ideally become a new breed of smaller publishers who are, are going to be good for indie authors because they understand digital publishing and ebook publishing. They understand those markets the way that traditional publishers just don't because they're still in the business of shipping dead trees around. And so I'm optimistic. That was a very fast summary of some of my notes. But I just wanted to think about the only other thing that happened a lot at Nick was there's a lot of talk and a lot more uh, details as authors were sharing and explaining. And again, I I went to that was barely um, I mean there were like four tracks on it every time and I and I and I and I didn't go to some of them because I was having meetings with people during sessions where I'd, I'd be about to go into a room and I'd bump into someone and we would just go and have a coffee or a, a drink and and talk for an hour during the session. So I only went to what maybe six of the fifty <laughs> sessions. Uh, but from what I've heard, they were all uh, fantastic. But as I was saying, there are more authors that are figuring out ways to sell direct. And whether that's leveraging BookFunnel and PayHip or WooCommerce or Shopify or other stores, um, there's a lot more of that 
ability to make 95% margin and selling direct. Now there, there's there's the taxes and issues, but there's different plugins and ways you can do that. I'll probably have to bring on a, a few experts uh, to do a panel perhaps. Uh, let me know, dear listener, if that would be useful for you, talking about different ways that you can sell direct. Because there, again, there's no one way to, to publish your books. There's no one way to sell direct. The best way is the way that works specifically for you. But selling direct is yet another way that authors can grow. Uh, they can um, they can sort of circumvent some of the risk of having all their eggs in one basket so they can have direct sales, they can be in direct contact with their customers, they can continue to leverage the tools from the different retailers that and distributors that are available. So there's there's some optimism. There's a, there's a lot of optimism there this year. And um, I was just so thrilled to be back at Novelist Inc. and hanging out with some amazing authors. And I hope, I know that was a bit of a whirlwind of brain farts that I was just sh- shooting out as I was flipping through this handy little notebook that I took. And, and it's funny, oh yeah, that's right, because the notebook I got at the end of the Kobo Writing Life presentation, so my Kobo Writing Life notes are on another piece of paper that's probably somewhere in the bottom of my laptop bag. But I did have some notes from uh, Laura and Rachel from Kobo Writing Life. And and just from what I can remember off the top of my head is, is something that I, I remember seeing stat-wise from uh, draft digital sales data is that the main growth, the biggest growth that uh, self-published authors have seen through Kobo Writing Life or through draft to digital is Kobo Plus because they're getting new customers that have not yet read ebooks and they're not cannibalizing the print uh, a la carte sales. These are just new customers that are coming in and going, oh, look, subscription reading. This is a great deal for me. And so Kobo is attracting newer customers in those markets. And so the main growth, almost the only growth that they've seen, uh, it's pretty stable on the other side of things for a la carte. But they're seeing is the growth of Kobo Plus and those subscription sales. And that's something, again, when you look at Scribd sales data, when you look at Kobo Writing Life, you're seeing a lot more of the growth that you used to see only in a la carte. That growth is is now coming with the new customer bases that are loving subscription reading. So, um, yeah, that's sort of the summary of Novelist Inc. Um, it's kind of cool to be back and engaging with people in person. I really did miss that. There's just something something extra about just sitting across from a table and having a coffee and talking to people. And, and I really miss that. I, I am happy in my home and by myself and introverted and all that, but I really do get a charge, limited times, I get a charge from being with people and sharing ideas because sometimes the ideas come just from being in that setting. So that is it for this episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. I hope you found my Nick Reflections interesting. I know and there would, would have been more had I been able to go to more things and there'll be things that come up over the next few weeks that I'll be thinking about and chewing on and I'll probably stick in here and there in my personal update. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.